Now, though, it's time for our health and science segment on the programme. And today, something of an existential topic for you. Achieving immortality or finding the elixir of life might sound like something out of a fantasy novel. But now billionaires in Silicon Valley are looking for a way to wage war against death itself. From predictive medicine to cell rejuvenation and cryogenics, might we one day be able to cheat death? Well, to try and answer that question, our health editor, Julia Seeger, is with me. And Julia, before I make you answer that question directly, um, tell us about these apps that are already in place that are promising to slow the aging process. That's right. That that's what the Humanity app does uh, now. Uh, it promises to slow your aging and also live longer and healthier lives by establishing what they call your rate of aging. So they call it a humanity score. It's out of 100. And it's going to tell you how quickly, well, it's set to tell you at least, how quickly your physical and mental abilities are declining. Now, it's going to give you advice and tips based on information and data that it's collecting from Fitbits, of course, you're going to have to, so it's going to tell them about your sleeping patterns. You're also going to have to answer all these questionnaires on how well you're eating, etc. But I think the strength really of this app is that it actually benchmark is this really individualized data on uh, uh, to a real world population. Now it's going to put it up against scientific databases that we call biobanks. Uh, so in this case, it's the UK uh, biobank with people of the same lifestyle, but also of the same demographic group. I have to say, Julie, I'm not sure I actually want to know how quickly my mental abilities I don't either, are actually, fading, but... <laughs> but tell us a bit about these biobanks. Well, we don't talk about biobanks a lot, but they're actually crucial, especially for re medical research. A biobank is a type of biorepository of, which stores biological uh, samples. So you have them in hospitals, for instance, whenever you do blood work, but also it can be tissues as well. And it's, uh, it's a huge database for international research today. It was actually used uh, very much instrumental in the sequencing of uh, the COVID-19 genome, for instance. But uh, it's really boosted uh, two different fields, genomics, of course, but also what we call predictive medicine. And what that actually means is what are the odds that you will develop a disease within uh, your lifetime so that you're able to predict it? Does that mean then... That prevent it, excuse me. To prevent it. So does that mean that biobanks are opening up ways for us to personalize medicine? Well, when we talk about predictive medicine, it also means, of course, personalized uh, medicine as well as be thanks to these biobanks with all of this information, you're able to find what we call biomarkers, understand why certain people at a certain age with certain pathologies are going to develop other uh, kinds of, of, of diseases. So it really gives us a lot of information and it helps us understand why that specific person is set to develop a disease within their lifetime. But the thing is that more and more private companies are having access to these biobanks, which are public, and they're using them to develop their uh, their business. For instance, in the United States, it's actually quite common for parents to run genetic tests on their newborns to know perhaps what, what are his chances of developing lung cancer or a cirrhosis, who knows? But so it can be interested if you do have in your family a history of genetic disorder, but if you don't, then you have to live with that, knowing that perhaps you know you have 40% chances of, living, of dying of cirrhosis. So that's quite uh, something to live with, right? Um, but so to prevent disease, there's also this other field that we talk about a lot. It's called gene therapy. We all have heard of it because it, it won the 2020 Nobel Prize. It's the CRISPR-Cas9 gene therapy. These are DNA scissors, which enable you to just get rid, target uh, the, a certain gene and get rid of it all together. And why not get rid of the aging gene, the, the gene that's responsible for aging? And that's actually what certain scientists are doing uh, in Asia. Because if you think about it, you know, aging is actually the biggest risk factor of almost any uh, disease. So of course we understand that the goal here is to try to prevent disease, to try to prevent pain, but at the same time we understand that increasingly it's about expand, uh, maximizing health and lifespan. And in Silicon Valley, uh, billionaires are now all about cheating death. So they're uh, really saying it uh, out loud. Uh, Jeff Bezos, for instance, has invested $199 billion into this new rejuvenate, re rejuvenation startup. It's called Altos Lab. And here he's actually betting on what we call biological reprogram, reprogramming technology. So I know it's uh, lots of complicated terms here, but what it actually means is that you're able 
to instruct a cell to revert back to, uh, to, uh, to its original properties of embryonic cells. So that actually means that you can rejuvenate your cells. So uh, it's only been tested on animals yet, uh, not on men yet, but it's, it's definitely another field. And last but not least, another field to try to beat death is, of course, cryogenics. Uh, you, the idea here is to, to really, uh, uh, cool, you know, it's, it involves cooling legally dead people uh, to uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures. And the idea is to wait for science to get there to be able to revive you. And here what's interesting is that people don't see dead death as really the end of life. It's just a part of it and a, you know, a phase you're going to go through. Existential stuff. Thanks very much indeed, Julia Seager. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We'll have to thank leave you. it there, but thank you.